Hello, BookTube. I am back, and we're ready for another fiction review. Now, you can read any book any time of the year, but there are some books that they evoke a season. I'm thinking of uh, Hubert Mingarelli's A Meal in Winter. Now, if winter is the time of year that gets you down a bit, if you don't like it when the days get shorter and the nights get longer and the temperature drops, then I would say don't read Mingarelli in the winter. Save him until the summer because he will make you think so much about cold and darkness that you'll need to have sunshine and warmth around you to compensate for that. But what you could also do is you could read the book that I'm going to review today because that would transport you imaginatively into a much warmer, lighter time of year. The Electric Lit website describes this title as printed and bound sunshine. And I don't think that's hype. I'm going to say that I felt that climate effect when I was reading the book. Uh, I'm going to put a link to the Electric Lit website because we're going to mention them later as well. Okay, today's book is Three Summers by Margarita Liberaki. It was translated from the Greek. The original book in 1946 was titled The Straw Hat, but the English translator Karen Van Dyke didn't feel that title would travel well, and so she was the one who came up with the title that we now have in translation, Three Summers. I don't have any photos, sadly, taken in Greece. That would be perfect for the sun and the light, which is so well described in this book. What we're going to do instead is display some of the different cover designs that have appeared in translated versions of this work. Okay, we will go into the first question. Can I pitch this novel in a few sentences? This is an evocative sensual work. It focuses on setting and the interiority of its characters rather than plot. It captures a lost time, the time before the Second World War, before Greece was occupied by the Axis powers and all the suffering that that caused. And it also captures that that sweeter, poignant kind of suffering of, of growing up, you know, the, the, the agony that every young person feels when they're trying to find their way into adulthood. In Greece, the book has been reprinted 51 times since it was first published in 1946, and it remains the novel that many Greek readers list as their all-time favorite book. Okay, so we'll do the practical things now. How long is this book? Well, the Penguin edition you see on the screen here is 245 pages long. I obtained it in a rather unusual way. There is a grocery store near the office where I work, and I'll often go there on my lunch breaks to get a few things. As you come out from the tills, when you paid for your groceries, and you're heading toward the exit doors, there's a table, and the grocery store allows various charities to set up the table as an honesty bookstall. So there's a couple of open boxes with secondhand books and a plastic tub where you can put a donation, and it's up to you what you want to give. And so I was, I always stop, and I have a quick look, and mostly there's nothing there. I'm interested in. I think one time they had like seven copies of Fifty Shades of Grey, but I saw this and I saw the penguin logo, the little bird in the orange circle. And that's, it's a guarantee of quality, isn't it? I'd never heard of Margarita Liberaki. I'd never heard of Three Summers. But as soon as I saw the penguin logo, I thought, okay, if Penguin chose to publish it, it must be something. So I paid, I think I made a donation of two pounds to take this little secondhand book away with me. But you can also buy it on Amazon. There are Kindle editions at £4.99 or $6.22 US. And I've also seen some even cheaper uh, secondhand copies on eBay and other websites. So, you know, definitely shop around. A Greek book cover seems appropriate when we're talking about the author. Margarita Liberaki was born in Athens in 1919. She was raised by her maternal grandparents. Now, they owned a bookstore and a publishing house, which acted as kind of a center for Greek intellectual life. Margarita herself studied law. While she was still a student, she married another lawyer, and she was expecting her first child the year that she wrote Three Summers. That marriage was short-lived. Margarita's daughter went to live with her husband's parents, and Margarita went to Paris to live on her own. She even changed her name. She altered the translated spelling so that it came out as Liberaki because she wanted it to, I guess, sound as though it was derived from the word liberation. So if that's anything to go by, this, this move must have been very important to her. 
Liberaki has written four other novels as well as several stage and screenplays. Uh, Karen Van Dyke, who did the English translation in the 1990s, actually worked face to face with Liberaki and with her daughter, and they were sharing a home at the time on the island of Hydra. So maybe that meant that she eventually returned to Greece to live. She died in 2001. Oh, this is my favorite book cover. This is the New York Review of Books edition. You'll pay a little bit more for this, though, by the way, in case you want to go out looking for that particular cover art. It does cost a little bit more than my lovely, cheap little Penguin edition. But it's perfect because this book, the next question, of course, is about setting. And this book is all about its setting. It pulls you right in to the Greek landscape and to the season itself. You're so comfortably immersed that it's no problem to suspend disbelief. You become one of the three sisters who are the main characters, Maria, Infanta, and Katerina. You're growing up in Greece. You're just outside Athens in the countryside. And as the characters act and speak, Liberaki inserts these short descriptive passages to evoke color and scent and sound. And I'm going to read you one of those from page 51. This is uh, Maria, the oldest, who's gone out walking on a very hot day. Outside, the time was in full bloom, and the sun was burning hot. Falaha, tied under a pine tree, was chewing away. It would be the first time she had gone with a billy goat, the first time she had borne a kid. Maria whispered as she passed by, If you only knew what was in store for you, if you only knew. The cicadas sang on and on. Every once in a while, a bee passed in front of her. It made a few circles round her head and then flew off for more time. The birds had quieted down, and everything, the pine trees, the earth, the animals, was a wave of heat. The vapor rising from the trees dimmed the sun. The gardens were beautiful this year. The heavy rains that winter had done them good. They were full of green, and the trunks of the trees were shiny. Tiny tomatoes were beginning to appear. You could already see the yellow stamen on the male pistachio trees and the female ones waiting. Right, okay, we'll describe narrative viewpoint and narrative voice. Well, the viewpoint is mainly, and I've got to stress just mainly, first person from the view of Katerina, the youngest of the girls. And she's the one also who's most given to kind of passionate, unpredictable responses. And it goes with the, the, the evocative season of heat and passion. But in the midst of any chapter, you will find episodes where you shift to the viewpoint of one of the other sisters, one of the older women, a couple of the male characters as well. So there is, a, there is truly a mixture of viewpoints, all told. And that slippery narration, I mean, it obviously owes something to modernism, given the year that the book was published 1946, but it must also owe something to Margarita's association with her grandparents, their bookshop, their publishing house. She must have been familiar, I would think, although I haven't researched this, with members of the Bloomsbury group, because when you read Three Summers, you note shifts of viewpoint and tense. And if you're familiar with Virginia Woolf, you can't help thinking that you're hearing faint echoes in admiration, you know, of maybe uh, Between the Acts was what came to mind as I was reading. I kept thinking of Virginia Woolf's Between the Acts. Now, the Electric Lit article, remember the one that I mentioned at the beginning of our review? They didn't credit Liberaki with having the same skill as Virginia Woolf with that kind of narrative technique. I partly agree. And yet I think it could also be said that Liberaki was evoking something different. She was evoking the chaos of adolescence and summer. And whereas if you think particularly of Virginia Woolf's Between the Acts, where Woolf herself is acting as metatheatrical stage manager, while she writes about the staging of an actual pageant at a, an English country house. So you can understand that, that just what the two books are dealing with, one is going to probably be more carefully structured in terms of its narrative shifts and changes than the other might be. Uh, to me, that just that made sense, given the, the focus of both books. Okay, next question. Does this novel fit a genre label? Uh, not quite. It is a literary coming-of-age story with a focus on what that means for females. If you're new to literary fiction, however, let's say uh, your reading has been mainly young adult or 21st century mass market fiction, where it, those are engineered by publishers to stimulate, and, and but you're wanting to transition, and you want something where you, something you can study, then I would say that Three Summers is a fantastic transition novel for that, because it provides sensory as well as literary stimuli.
Next question. Is there anything readers should bear in mind when deciding to read this novel? Well, even though we are in paradise, it's important to remember the constriction of women's lives. In 1946, when this book was published, women still did not have the right to vote in Greece. They did not get that until six years later. It wasn't unusual for women to marry young. The character Maria is married at 21 and Katerina receives the marriage proposal before she's 20 and everyone except Katerina is ecstatic about that. And with no reliable means of contraception, all of them became full-time mothers very quickly. And this is where the viewpoint of the older women becomes interesting. Liberaki creates passages from the diary of Maria's mother-in-law, Laura, and they serve to show just how quickly the excitement of matrimony and motherhood wear thin and how little the young women realize this. This is a quote from that diary on page 110. I hate dissatisfied women, Maria said as she stood up after lunch to close the shutters. She had seen me staring out the window absentmindedly. Her comment didn't come out of the blue. We had been discussing the subject at the table. Yanis and Marios were saying that dissatisfied women live in their own imaginary world. That is, they're deluded. So there are no women who are rebelling inside, I said. Rebelling against what? asked Yanis. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, against their womanly fate, perhaps. I don't know. A desire for something else. Something impossible. Something they don't dare do. That's just cowardice said Katerina, but she didn't manage to finish her sentence before Anna threw her a fierce glance. Anna, the woman who throws that fierce glance, is Katerina's mother. Now we want to know if there's any problematic content in this book. Well, Three Summers has a natural conservatism. It's not an agenda. It's just a reflection of the narrative point of view, which, as you know, it's like the three girls who are central to the story. Young, rural, sheltered, the strict piety of the girl's Aunt Teresa. It demonstrates how religion still played a pretty strong role in pre-war society and influenced attitudes to behavior. There's no violence talked about or abusive relationships. There is a single sex scene described mainly in metaphor and with descriptions of the emotions involved more than the body parts. And that doesn't last longer than a paragraph. Right. Well, that saves us a little time, doesn't it? Because we don't have to uh, talk about the reasons for the non-existent problematic content. We can just go straight on and talk about suggestions for related follow-up reading. I'm going to put in the description box a link to the Penguin website because Three Summers is just one of seven books that is part of the Penguin European Writers Series. I looked at the website myself. I thought all seven titles looked interesting. And they obviously were picked for the impact they had on readers who experienced the books in the original languages. The cover art, they've made that very memorable. I think if you were going into a secondhand bookshop or a charity shop, those covers would stand out and be very easy to spot. Also, I enjoyed reading the article by Karen Van Dyke for the Paris Review. Karen, as we've said before, translated Three Summers into English with the help of Margarita Liberaki and her daughter, Margarita, who also became a writer. So look down in the description box for a link to the Paris Review also. Oh, and I can go straight to my closing comments now. Now, I, I want to wrap up and tell you about new material, but I've got so many different ideas going on in my head. It makes me wish that I had more time to make content. I am 91% through a Kindle version of Reading Like a Writer by Francine Prose, so that will be our next nonfiction review. But I've also started reading George Eliot's Middlemarch. I am ashamed to admit that in my usual fashion, uh, I have not read any George Eliot, or I did not until I went to university and I had to read The Mill on the Floss as an assignment. And then, of course, I realized, oh, my God, this woman is, well, she blew my mind. There's no, no other way to put it. So I'm not going to read it to do a review, obviously. And I'm also going to read it very, very slowly. But what I was thinking of doing was maybe some close readings as sideline videos, just not looking at anything more than like two, maximum three pages, but looking deeply. And now that I have a, a better microphone and camera you know, I don't know. I also want to record more poetry. That was an experiment, that little Walt Whitman snippet. But I didn't like the sound very much. It was muffled. So that, that was what made me go out and get a, a new camera and microphone to improve things a little bit. Look, but thanks very much for checking out this video. 
I'm looking very much forward to seeing you again next time, everybody. Bye-bye.